I'd like to welcome you today to today's uh, presentation of the Congressional Biomedical Research Caucus featuring Dr. Ke Hannah Kenny from Harvard Medical School. Um, I'd like to do a special thanks to our co-chairs of the caucus, and that's Representative Brian Bilbray from California, Charlie Dent from Pennsylvania, Jackie Spear from California, and Rush Holt from New Jersey for their commitment, dedication, and ongoing support of our caucus. I'd also like to thank the Howard Hughes Medical Institute for providing a grant that supports our ability to host these timely and important briefings. We do videotape these every briefing, and you can find past briefings on the CLS website at coalitionforlifesciences.org. You can also register for an RSS feed in order to be alerted to future postings. Um, as mentioned, we will be hearing from Dr. Hannah Kinney today. Dr. Kinney is a professor of pathology at Harvard Medical School in Boston and a pediatric neuropathologist at Children's Hospital in Boston. Her lab performs research in developmental disorders of the human brain in early life, with a focus on brain disorders leading to sudden death in fetuses, infants, and children. Today we will hear about her cutting-edge research that has led to a greater understanding of the underlying causes of sudden infant death syndrome. Dr. Kinney's publication record includes 100 original articles, 34 reviews, and 12 chapters. She has received multiple awards for her contributions to SIDS and developmental brain research, as well as invitations for honorary SID lectureships. If you will, please join me in welcoming Dr. Kinney. Thank you very much, Lynn. It's really an honor and a privilege to be here today to talk to you about our work in SIDS. And I'd especially like to thank Lynn for orchestrating this and putting this together. So I've been asked to speak to you about our research in SIDS, which extends over 25 years. And this work, I'm very excited to tell you about the kinds of discoveries we're making and how this is leading to us a better understanding of SIDS. I would like this kind of work has been supported by many years for uh, many people for 25 years, including SIDS families, SIDS parents, and SIDS foundations. And to them, I'm all very grateful. But it is without the support of the federal government and the National Institutes of Health that this research that I'm about to tell you would not be possible. 95% of the funding for this research comes from the National Institute of Child Health and Development, the Eunice Kennedy Shriver NICHD. They have funded this research continuously for 25 years, and I can't stress to you enough how important it is to have continuous funding to test ideas, to develop them, to collect cases over time, to make discoveries, and then to confirm those discoveries in subsequent databases and with different methods. And it's without this steadfast support that this kind of research would not be possible. I'd like to thank in particular Dr. Marion Willinger, the Special Assistant for SIDS from the NICHD, for being here today. Thank you, Marion. So, like this mother here, all parents watch over their babies and sleep, and they were entrusted with their survival in these very vulnerable moments. And like all parents, we reach out to touch the baby to see if that baby is still breathing, if that baby is still alive. There's hardly a parent who has not done that. And it's because we know and we fear instinctively that the baby will die during its sleep, inexplicably and suddenly. We intrinsically fear the sudden infant death syndrome. The National Institutes of Child Health and Development defines SIDS as the sudden death of an infant under one year of age that remains unexplained after complete case review. And that includes the autopsy, the death scene investigation, and review of the clinical history. Typically, a seemingly healthy infant, as if nothing is wrong with this infant, is found dead after sleep period either after the nighttime sleep or a nap. We don't know whether the baby dies during sleep or in many of the transitions between sleep and waking during the sleep period. 90% of these deaths occur in the first six months of life with about two, a peak at two to four months, which may be changing slightly 
but historically between two to four months. So this suggests that any theory or hypothesis about the cause of SIDS must take into account sleep and must take into account this developmental um, uh, profile. Now, what I'd like to do in the next 30 minutes is to give you some key SID statistics, define for you the triple risk model for SIDS that guides our work, review for you the brainstem hypothesis in SIDS, and then the evidence for brainstem abnormalities in SIDS that our laboratory has defined over the last 25 years. And then I would like to conclude as to how this research, basic research, is making babies safe in terms of de developing ways to identify brainstem abnormalities in living babies and then eventually to treat them and prevent death from occurring. Now, the sudden infant death syndrome is the leading cause of postneonatal infant mortality in the United States today. That's between 1 and 12 months of age. Approximately 2,300 uh, 2, deaths occur a year. That would be six deaths a day in the United States to the sudden infant death syndrome. SIDS is the third leading cause of infant mortality in general, and that's behind congenital malformations and low birth weight slash prematurity. There are many risk factors for SIDS. The major ones are male. SIDS occurs more often in boys than girls. Prematurity. Today, one-third of SIDS babies were born prematurely. Poverty. Today, it's estimated that three-fourths of the babies who die of SIDS are in families living under the poverty line. And African American and American Indians have a greater risk, two times or more the risk than whites. This poverty, African American, American Indian, tells us that SIDS is a problem of health disparities. And if we are to address SIDS, we have to address issues of health disparities in health care and cultural method messages to our most vulnerable populations, the American Indian and African Americans. SIDS also, the risk is increased if there's an exposure of the uh, fetus to maternal smoking or to alcohol consumption. The risk for SIDS increases four times if the mother smokes during pregnancy and six to eight times if the mother drinks in the first trimester. And I'm going to come back to these risk factors through the talk. Now, without question, the most spectacular advance in SIDS research was the recognition in the late 80s, early 1990s, that the risk for SIDS increased threefold or more if the infant was placed to sleep on its belly, prone sleep. And then health campaigns were initiated to make, put babies to sleep on their back. And as a result of this parallel event happening, the SIDS rate dropped in half when the Na American Academy of Pediatrics and the NICHD instituted the back to sleep campaigns as the incidence of putting the baby on its back to sleep, now about 75% of infants, the rate of SIDS dropped in half. However, you'll notice that the rate has plateaued over the last decade. And so we still have not completely eradicated SIDS by these safe sleep messages. And so it's incumbent upon us to find the cause. Now, in our laboratory, Dr. Jim Filiano, at that time a postdoc at Children's Hospital at Harvard, now on, uh, a professor at Dartmouth Medical School, and I uh, proposed the triple risk model for SIDS in 1994. This is the model that guides our research. This is how we conceptualize the SIDS problem. That is, we think of SIDS as occurring when three factors come together simultaneously, the vulnerable infant, the critical developmental period, and the exogenous stressor. And when these three factors impinge upon the infant simultaneously, sudden death results. So let me walk you through that model. 
The critical developmental period refers to that first year of life. The first six months were 90%. Something very important about development is happening. And we think of it in terms of that transition of the fetus to independent life, where that infant must protect itself off the placenta and having been delivered into the world. And then there is the vulnerable infant. We would say that SIDS babies are not normal. Of course, normal babies will die in crib accidents and will die in strangulation in the crib. But what we're saying is that most SIDS infants who have an underlying pathophysiological disease process, if you will, that puts them at risk. And that's why all babies don't die. You hear people say, well, the baby slept on its tummy and the baby didn't die. And we would say that is because the baby did not have the underlying vulnerability. And then this vulnerable baby meets a stressor at the time of death. And that would be in the bedding, in the soft bedding, face down, in the prone position, and having low oxygen, rebreathing carbon dioxide, and going on to die because it has a vulnerability that prevents it from protecting itself against the stressor. So how do we put the risk factors into this for SIDS? Our laboratory has suggested they be divided into extrinsic risk factors that are the stressors the night of death, prone sleep position bed sharing, one or more people in in this bed surface, sharing the bed surface with an infant. Risk for SIDS increases twofold in that, and if the baby is under one month, sevenfold, seven times the risk for SIDS in a one-month-old or less baby. Uh, Over-bundling, soft bundling, or the face covered. These all increase the risk for SIDS, and all suggest a stressor, a trigger, if you will, the night of death. Then we believe there are factors that are intrinsic to the infant itself and contribute to that vulnerability, such as male gender. What does having male have to do by increasing the risk? Prematurity and a lag in developmental mechanisms. Genetic variants or polymorphisms that increase susceptibility And then we think of the prenatal exposures to cigarettes and alcohol somehow during the development of the fetus increasing and acting and interplaying with the vulnerability. Now, I'm going to come back to these themes as we go through the talk, but that's basically how we've conceptualized the problem. Now, if you go back here, you can say the way we see this model is you can take away the exogenous stressor And the vulnerable infant will live through that period unharmed. And that's how you can decrease the SIDS rate without ever knowing the cause, by removing the environmental stressors without knowing the cause. And how can that be? How can you do that? And that's when I think of the lesson in epidemiology versus laboratory science. And we go to the famous cholera epidemic in London in the Broad Street Pump. At that time, the germ theory of disease was not known. We know today that cholera is due to a bacterium and that you can give antibiotics and kill bacteria. But they didn't know it in mid-19th century London. This was before the germ theory of disease. But the physician, John Snow, figured out that there were more cases of cholera around a particular pump, the Broad Street pump, than in other parts of London. And he suggested if you take the handle off the pump, you modify the environment, cholera will go away. And in fact, the legend is that in fact, cholera did decrease, the risk rates decreased when the pump handle was removed. This is a famous story of how epidemiology and adjusting environmental factors change the course of disease, just as changing sleep environment is changing the rate of SIDS. However, uh, and for this recognition, John Snow is called the father of epidemiology. 
But what always trumps epidemiology is when you find the cause, when there's laboratory science that finds the organism. In AIDS, recognizing that it was a problem of homosexual men from epidemiology and then discovering the virus as a part of laboratory research. Epidemiology and basic research hand in hand. So what we're trying to do in SIDS in our laboratory, the pump's been removed, but we're trying to find the bacteria, so to speak, the cause. Now, the theory that guides our work in SIDS is the brainstem hypothesis. According to this driving theory, SIDS, or a subset of SIDS, is due to an abnormality in the brainstem, the lower part of the brain, that impairs the infant's ability to protect him or him, herself from life-threatening challenges during sleep. And the way we see this, then, is that the baby in the prone position, face down or face covered or with too much soft bedding, has, will build up high levels of hyper, uh, carbon dioxide, low levels of oxygen, there may be transitory changes in blood pressure or increases or even decreases in temperature. These are homeostatic challenges, life-threatening challenges. And they suggest that they have share with those triggers of the exogenous factors. Now, who, where in the brain is there protection against these life-threatening challenges? And that's in the brainstem. The brainstem has pathways that mediate arousal so that when the baby breathes too much carbon dioxide, it lifts up its head, turns, and wakes, and that protects the airway. Or gasping to recover, it becomes so, um, stops breathing, babies will regenerate, as will adults, breathing through auto-resuscitation, starting to jumpstart their own respiration when oxygen is returned. And there must be mechanisms to recover blood pressure and temperature. All of this is mediated by the brainstem. So it's logical that our group 25 years ago would go after the brainstem. And how would we do this? Well, first of all, let's just go through one scenario of the chain of events that might happen. So let's say the baby is in soft bedding, face down in the prone position and it's beginning to breathe, rebreathe carbon dioxide or build up a blow up, and then oxygen gets lower and lower. These kinds of challenges, changes in oxygen and carbon dioxide, would stimulate the brainstem. The baby would lift its head or turn its head, arouse, and get itself out of that environment. But we would say there's a defect in the brainstem. The baby doesn't respond to the low oxygen or high carbon dioxide. It fails to arouse. It goes into coma because it doesn't have enough oxygen. Its heart rate slows. It begins to gasp. But it can't get, jump start. It auto-resuscitate its own respiration. Two hits, failure to arouse, failure to resuscitate, and the infant goes on to die. So what our group has done is to dissect these systems that protect uh, against life-threatening challenges in the brainstem. And we've done this by looking at neurotransmitters, which are the chemical signals, the way by which one nerve cell talks to another. And here's a nerve cell talking to another, and it releases the neurotransmitter, it binds to the receptors in the next nerve cell, and excites it or inhibits it depending on the receptor. This is the way nerve cells talk to each other. There are over 100 neurotransmitters, and they are the chemical messengers between cells. Why are we interested in neurotransmitters? Virtually all drugs that are effective in the nervous system, in depression, in Parkinson's disease, in schizophrenia, act at the synapse where the receptor and the neurotransmitter interact. These are the pharmacological drugs we use today, and we're ultimately looking for a drug in SIDS. Now, one of the most um, uh, major neurotransmitters we focused on is serotonin, and this is made in nerve um, cells 
in the lower part of the brain stem. And serotonin is involved in circuits that control the airway, that control the diaphragm for breathing, sweat glands for temperature control, the heart rate, and blood pressure control. If you will, serotonin is a neurotransmitter that's involved in integrating and mediating protective responses. And so our laboratory has gone on to look at serotonin as well as other neurotransmitters. And we have used, over the last 25 years, multiple methods to assess each case maximally. These tissues are precious. The controls are rare. Baby scarring of non sids causes that are autopsy are, the cause, are used as controls, extraordinarily rare. Every case is dissected as most carefully we can and applying state-of-the-art techniques, looking at neurotransmitter receptors with autoradiography, neurotransmitter levels with high-performance liquid chromatography, neuron shapes and sizes, peptides with proteomics, western blocks for proteins and genes, and looking at genomics and using genomic techniques. Now, where do these cases and controls come from? In our laboratory, they come from California. And those of you who are from California here today, how many of you are from California? You have to know that your state has been absolutely visionary in SIDS research. What happened in California is they passed a law in 1989. Sorry. And what happened was that one of your legislators, Barry Brokoff, who's been very verbal and very public about this, had a trial dive SIDS, and went and saw that there was not much SIDS research being done. He brought the SIDS parents together in California. They lobbied the legislature, and they passed this. Eventually, the legislature passed the law. And what does this law do? It authorizes the uses of tissues from infants dying suddenly and unexpectedly under the jurisdiction of the medical examiner for research without direct parental consent. Why is that important? Because in the horrific hours following the SIDS death, a researcher does not have to step into the home and consent for tissue use. The state has, in its wisdom, consented to this. This law also mandates the use of standardized death scene and autopsy protocols in the investigation of sudden infant death. This bill was advocated and written by SIDS parents, and, or certainly overseen by SIDS parents, and it is the only state in the United States with this law. My collaborations and our laboratory collaborations began with Henry Krauss, the chief medical examiner of Cal in San Diego in 1991. This research greatly facilitates, or this law greatly facilitates research directly in autopsy infant tissues. Now, what have we found over the last 25 years? The major finding has been related to the neurotransmitter serotonin, and this has resulted in four major publications extending from 2000 to 2010 with different investigators and different data sets. We found decreased serotonin, 5-HT stands for serotonin, receptor binding in over half the babies. And this has been confirmed in four data sets in our laboratory, including in the American Indians, which are a high-risk population. There are decreased serotonin levels, decreased levels of tryptophan hydroxylase, which is the enzyme that produces serotonin, decrease in levels of the transporter that brings serotonin back up into the cell, and the cells have an immature morphology. You would think with all this decrease and deficiency that there would actually be decreased numbers of cells that produce serotonin. But surprisingly, we found that the cells were actually increased in number. And we wonder if this is a compensatory mechanism 
something that we're exploring now. And this, I don't know if you can see this with the lighting, but this is a map of neurotransmitter receptors. The highest finding is in red. This is the medulla, a low part of the brain stem, and we're measuring the serotonin of one of the serotonin receptors. The highest concentration is in red, it's a color scale, the high, lower in green, and no receptor in black or blue. And here's the control infant. This is the normal pattern of receptor amount. And here you see in Sid's case, this virtual absence of the receptor. Now I look at this and I think, mean, how could the baby live at all without serotonin receptors? How did it get to two months, or three months, or four months? But in animal studies now, we are measuring in knockout mice of the serotonin receptor, and those mice live to adulthood. And their films look like this. So it's much more than just having an absence of the serotonin receptor, but it's, and we found that in animals that we stress with challenges in the postnatal period, they do go on to die. So we've looked at a number of neurotransmitter systems, and we found abnormalities not only in serotonin, but what's recently published around GABA. We found abnormalities in the nicotinic receptor that binds to um, uh, nicotine and cigarette smoke, but only in those babies who have been exposed to smoke in utero. So it's not just serotonin alone, it's a network of neurotransmitters that we believe govern protective responses. But they lead to an impaired protective responses when the infant meets a stressor and then sleep-related sudden death results in the critical period. If I, wanted, if I ask you at the end of this talk, what did this laboratory found over 25 years? The bottom line is that in the majority of six infants have brainstem abnormalities. And why is that so important? Because it means there's an underlying biological problem in these babies. These are not normal babies. Yes, normal babies die in accidents, but we do not believe SIDS is a crib accident, but that there's an underlying pathological problem in the brainstem. And that targets a region of the brain, a neurotransmitter system, for diagnostic and therapeutic strategies in living infants, and a target for the development of the way to diagnosis in autopsy, where the medical examiner could do a test for a serotonin or transmitter defect, and no longer call it SIDS, but a special name for that disorder. Now you're probably asking, what's the cause of What's the cause of a serotonin deficiency? And that's a huge area for our research now. Like all diseases, SIDS must involve complex interplay of genes and environmental factors. In our lab, uh, certain people in our group are investigating are there in spontaneous mutations, particularly in the development of serotonin neurons, that could lead to serotonin deficiencies. We've explored, for example, the so-called FEV gene, which is a transcription factor for serotonin development, and not found in abnormality. Could it be a dietary deficiency in the mother? Could it be hypoxia to the fetus? These are all ideas we're investigating. Could it be prenatal exposure to smoking or drinking? Now, I told you in the beginning that smoking and drinking were risk factors. They, keep, they increase the probability that the baby would die sick. But if a risk factor is so strong and so consistent, then you have to begin to think of it as having a causal role. And let's take the example of lung cancer. In lung cancer, it, Smoking was originally regarded as a risk factor. Experimentally, in cultures and so forth, it's found that nicotine or other byproducts of smoking could cause cells to mutate and become cancerous. So it, the risk factor led to testing of an idea for causation. We all know people who have lung cancer who didn't smoke. 
And we know that all people who smoke don't have lung cancer. So there's this complex interplay of gene susceptibility and other environmental factors, and that's what we're looking for in the SIDS. But could prenatal exposure to cigarette smoke, and particularly nicotine in cigarette smoke, or alcohol cross the placenta, cross the fetal blood brain barrier, enter the fetal brain, and alter the development of the serotonin system? And you should know now that there is a large NICHD, NIAAA study to look at alcohol and smoking in relationship to SIDS. And it's called the Safe Passage Study. Its mission is to determine the role of prenatal alcohol and smoking in the risk for SIDS and other adverse pregnancy outcomes such as stillbirth and fetal alcohol syndrome. But a major focus is on SIDS. What's important about this NICHD, NIAAA study is that it's a prospective study of 12,000 pregnancies with a one-year follow-up of infants. The main study groups include women who are at very high risk for drinking and smoking during pregnancy. And those are the American women, Indian women in the Northern Plains and the mixed ancestry in the Western Cape of South Africa. Their rates for SIDS are, you know, are uh, even up to four times the rates of whites in the United States. And so we have targeted these populations, but we're also studying the Caucasian women in the Northern Plains. And the focus of this study, which is now past 6,000 enrollment of women, is upon the role of alcohol and tobacco in relationship to SIDS but also to autonomic and respiratory function in fetuses and infants, and in brainstem neurotransmitter pathology and autopsy. And this autopsy work of the brainstem is being done in our laboratory at Children's Hospital. I hope in five years I can come back to you and tell you the results of this study and what the role of alcohol and smoking really was in a, in a natural cohort of living um, infants with the population of SIDS. Now, to conclude, where is this all going? What's the bottom line? The goal is to identify through a test the baby who's at risk for SIDS in the pediatrician's office or at birth in the nursery. And so how would we do that? We would want to identify the vulnerable infant. So our laboratory now is looking at translational research. We've begun to look at potential biomarkers in the tissue, uh, ideally a blood-related test of some measures of serotonin in the blood that would reflect blood levels in the brain. Genetic polymorphisms, maybe in serotonin function or other neurotransmitter function, through gene testing would suggest risk. Many groups around the world are looking for physiological markers, functional markers. Could abnormal hearing test in the neonate reflect abnormal brainstem function? Could measures of heart rate or heart rate variability or temperature or arousal, could we develop tests for physiology that could pick up these babies before they die. And that's a very active area of research in our lab and others. And then, once you've identified the baby, you want to treat the baby, and you want to prevent the death from happening. Now, we already know that you can have the same sleep campaign messages that reduce the exogenous stressors and bring the baby through unharmed. But the goal of our work, and we are working on this now, is to develop drugs that would interact with these abnormal neurotransmitter systems to prevent death during the critical period. Now, we think of serotonin drugs being used in depression, for example, today, to relieve depression in patients, or dopamine drugs in schizophrenia. That is the kind of model that we're working on, that we would identify the risk in the infant, and then treat that baby in <coughs> a vulnerable period. Now, how do you get to all this information? 
you have to work with animal models. And in human pathology, such as I've said, we've made a list of problems in transmitters and regions, but we can, we can define the abnormalities at the cellular level and the molecular level, but we don't know what's cause and what's effect. Looking at autopsy is a snapshot of what the problem is. So we test ideas about causation, about mechanisms and treatments in whole animal systems and cell culture. And the NICHD has funded now for over a decade a group of us in New England and San Diego, California at Radio Children's, the University of Iowa, the Protocol Project, looking at the interplay between the human pathology and animal models. And let me give you, in closing, just one example of an animal model. I know the slide's a little complicated, but follow it through with me. We know from tracing to babies that it, here's breathing, heart rate, and oxygen level. Normally, we're breathing along, in and out, and our heart rate is stable. If we hit no oxygen or hypoxia, low oxygen, individuals stop breathing and become apneic. And then they start to gasp and start up and generate their breathing, and then they recover breathing, and that's called autoresuscitation. The blood, the heart rate drops, and of course blood pressure would, but as gasping becomes effective, the heart rate is restored, blood is returned to the brain, and the individual recovers. Now there have been unfortunate circumstances where SIDS babies have died while they're being monitored. Either the parents didn't hear the monitor, for whatever reason, the infant went on to die. And there are a handful of these tracings in SIDS community, research community. And what's been found in these babies is they have some kind of event, we don't know, but they're on a monitor for the heart rate and for their breathing. And they become, they stop breathing. They must have some kind of hypoxic event. Maybe it's in the prone position. There's not a video camera on these babies, so we don't know. And then they stop breathing, and then they start to gasp. But the gasps don't work. They're too little, they're too far apart, and the baby stops breathing and never recovers respiration. Our laboratory wanted to know, is that failed autoresuscitation true of mice who don't make serotonin? We used the genetic mutation of serotonin, the PET1 knockout, and through the work of our program project at Dartmouth, we found that the serotonin mouse, the mouse mutant lacked serotonin, also fails to gasp, fails to recover its heart rate, and goes on to die of SIDS. And what is astounding about the PET1 knockout, about this mouse, this chain of events only happens in early postnatal life and not in the very early mouse or the very older mouse. There's a critical window in which this failed autoresuscitation occurs. This is a mouse with genetic mutation in serotonin neurons but only dies and fails to auto-resuscitate at a certain age, early in life. So the question that the caucus gave to me is, and the title was, How Research is Keeping Babies Safe. I break the answer down into two ways. One is now, and that would be that our research is giving a plausible explanation to parents about what could be happening, why the safe mess sleep messages are working. Who would think that just turning a baby on its back would save its life? I mean, most responses is that's ridiculous, right? So that's just got to be ridiculous. I'm not gonna do it. And because I know that my mother had us and put us all on our tummies. And now we talk about the model, the vulnerable infant, the brain stem defect there, and it gives a possibility that makes it more likely that the messages will be followed. Also, the, all the information our program project is learning is critically important to many disorders of breathing, 
autonomic function, sleep, and arousal. And this includes breathing problems in Rett syndrome, autism, uh, Prader Willi syndrome, a whole host of other defects in all serotonin, and these problems in, in uh, autonomic and respiratory control. Ultimately, we are in the process and hope to have biomarkers to identify infants at risk, biomarkers for autopsy diagnosis, and targeted interventions to prevent SIDS infants at risk, those that we've identified. And the goal then is not for any parent ever again to have to reach out to sleeping baby to see if that baby is still alive. But the goal is that all mothers and fathers will smile at the sleeping baby, knowing that they are safe in sleep. I'd like to thank, in conclusion, all of the people that have worked on this in my laboratory, the Safe Passage Study, the San Diego Collaborators, and the members of the program project at Dartmouth University of Iowa, Yale, and uh, San Diego as well, Harvard and Boston Children's Hospital. And I would like to thank the funding agencies, particularly Denise Kennedy Shriver, NICHD, the special assistant Marion in particular for her support over these years in this work. This work is also funded by private foundations and by the SIDS families themselves. I'm most willing to take any questions and thank you for listening. Thank you. The mice you've altered to have no serotonin level, some of them had grown into adulthood. Did you notice if their offspring carried the same lack of serotonin, or was that not studied, or is there we any consideration? We didn't study that. We didn't uh, study that. Um, so I can't that. What did you force the mice to sleep with certain You know, you bring up a really good point. What animal sleeps prone? in the wild. What animal sleeps on its belly? And I remember Marion, many, many years ago, the NICHD had a um, consensus conference, is there a natural animal model for SIT? And I remember you inviting people who watched primates, you know, baboons and chimpanzees in the wild, did the baby sleep home, they sleep with the mother. And um, there's no way we can model that prone position. It's a really good question, and trust me, we have thought about how to do that. Yes. I'm not a parent myself, but I'm just curious, are there more serious risks also associated with having a baby sleep on its back as opposed to sleeping on the stomach? Well, I, I, you bring up, you know, when, and Eric can remember this too, in 1991, in the 90s, when discussion was, should the NICHD and the federal government and the American Academy of Pediatrics to make a recommendation for a pro, what's the risk of sleeping on the back? And people said, well, they vomit or they aspirate, and that has just not really held to be true in subsequent looking at it. So the risk of prone is far greater than the risk on the back. Um, I was wondering, um, after the first year, does the absence of serotonin receptors affect the human in any other way? So, you know, great question. And, you know, it really goes back to, and this is something we spend a lot of time on too. So you've got this vulnerable infant, has a serotonin defect, you never let that baby sleep on its back, you don't know who it is, but it never sleeps on its back, it's never overheated, it gets through, the critical period unharmed. Well, then what happens? Does it develop autism, sleep apnea, learning disability, childhood depression? What happens? And we don't know. And we're looking for the change in risk of other childhood diseases that might, in this period, answer that question. Or is it just something about that developmental period, like in the pet one knockout mouse? Other mechanisms come in and compensate. 
you know, and recover, there's a rewiring in some way. And we're studying the PET1 knockout to the mouse to see what happens to it. Why doesn't it die like that, you know, at two months? Great, you know. Did you have a question? Yeah, what about babies who are sleeping on their back and turn over? Is that an issue? Yes, that's very much. It's, there's actually a name. I guess that's called secondary perm, right, Marion? There's a name for it. <laughs> you know, when the baby rolls over. And in fact, there are instances where the parents have that was the first night the baby rolled over. How do we protect that? You know, our, you know, commercial companies are putting styrofoam on the pajamas and so forth so the baby doesn't roll. Velcro. I don't know. <laughs> not styrofoam. Yeah, you know, Velcro on the pajamas. But it's a, it's a real problem. And that secondary tone and that rolling over and being the first event, you know, is part of it. Does this happen multiple times in families? It rarely, it can't, very rarely. It's a very slight, but mostly no. Very interesting. I hope you put yourself out of work. I do too. <laughs> <laughs> that is the point. This is very exciting <laughs> to hear. Yes. Early on you mentioned health disparities, and I was wondering if you had any guesses, and I realize it probably is a guess, um, I, what portion of that might be due to not getting the safe sleep messages and implementing them in their communities and what might be due to some other factors? Well, I will let Marion speak to that because okay. that Sorry. is the issue. I'm the <laughs> scientist and I look you know, to the messages the government gives and the office here gives, but um, is it a genetic factor that to Black uh, race or American Indians have a genetic susceptibility in serotonin, or that's something we're looking at. Okay. Or we're is it environmental? That. Is it related to poverty, that they can't afford crits, and so there's more bed sharing? That the burden of the risk factors are on our minority and our poorest populations. But Marion, about the message to these communities, what would you say? Well, I would say that in some communities, they are getting the message we're making, and it's concerted effort with outreach into those communities. We have a special uh, program with tribal communities. We have a special program in Mississippi, which has been very effective. We've developed with a lot of the um, community organizations um, and sororities, the black uh, sororities, special outreach materials. So we're working very hard. And we right now have a program announcement, so a call for special grant applications that are due next week um, for interventions that target in particular high-risk communities to, get, to find better ways to deliver the message and, and be more effective with the back to sleep message. The SIDS rates in these communities have dropped, but the disparity has remained. Thank you very much. Thank you for all coming.